Father God, again, we come before you and we thank you for allowing us to be here in your presence. God, we thank you for your word, for giving us your word, for revealing yourself to us. Lord, for allowing us to ask you questions that are on our hearts and, and in our minds. Lord, that you invite us to be honest with you. And as Habakkuk does that, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us to be honest with you uh, in all of the, the good times and the bad times and to be able to trust in you and to rest in, in your goodness, in your grace, and your sovereignty, and in your promises as well. We pray that you'd be with those who aren't here this morning. If they're coming here, we pray that you would uh, give them safe travels here this morning. And Lord, if they're not coming, we pray that uh, you would be working in their hearts and minds and, and drawing them closer to yourself as well. Lord, be giving us a, a love for your word and a love for you too, that we would grow in, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, each and every day. Again, we thank you for this time, and we pray that you would give us understanding as we study your word here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's looking through the, the beginning of Habakkuk. Oh, here's Evan. Morning, Evan. Evan, I think Henry's in there already. There, he'll head on in pretty quickly. Uh, at the beginning of Habakkuk, Habakkuk asks the question here, uh, God, where are you? Why aren't you answering my prayers? Why are you allowing the evil people to wicked? I cry out to you, violence, and yet you do not save. How long must I wait for you to help? And then the Lord uh, responds to Habakkuk and tells him the things that are going to happen. And it's not, a, it's not a very fun or pleasant message, is it? It's a message saying, hey, I'm raising up a people. I'm doing something new that you're not going to believe. Even if I told you, you're going to have a hard time believing this, but I am, I am doing this, and I am behind this. And so the Lord is behind uh, growing, bringing up the, the Babylonians who are going to come, and, and we'll put it this way, who are going to come and teach uh, the people of Judah a lesson, a much-needed lesson, calling them back to the Lord, saying, this is what happens when you turn your back on the Lord. And Habakkuk really wrestles with that and says, God, this doesn't make sense. I can't, I can't understand why you're doing this. How can you do this? And the Lord continues to answer his questions there in chapter 2. Again, pointing back to who he is, his character, his nature, and his power and authority as well. And letting them know that, listen, I know what I'm doing. You can trust me. The Babylonians aren't getting off scot-free either. They too will also be judged for their, uh, their wickedness. But right now, it's you and your people that need to be judged for your wickedness. So that's the, the message of chapters 1 and 2. And then we get to chapter 3 where Habakkuk is responding in prayer to uh, what the Lord has, has revealed to him. So he says here, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to the Shigiano. I think that's some kind of musical term or something, so don't, don't press me on that. Uh, since there's another pastor here, I'll get to ask Brandon. Brandon, do you know what the Shigiano is? You don't use those in Culbertson? Yeah, we don't use them here either. Uh, if anyone wants to look into that, you can look into that too. But that's uh, Habakkuk is making, uh, praying to the Lord here. And so here in, in verse 2, he says, Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk is praying to the Lord, and he says, Lord, I, I fear. Or another translation would say, I stand in Ah, I'm standing in awe of, of what's happening, of, of what you are doing. What reason does Habakkuk have to, to fear and to stand in awe? As I just kind of summarized the first, first two chapters for you briefly, but what reason might Habakkuk have to, to fear the Lord or to stand in awe of the Lord based off of what he has just said? Yeah, the Babylonians are going to come in and take control, and that's not going to be a pretty sight, and that is definitely something that will is a cause for fear, right? Anything else? Maybe we can ask this. We'll, we'll broaden it up here beyond just the two chapters of Habakkuk that we've been looking at the last couple of weeks. What kind of reports of the Lord might cause you to fear or stand in awe? What are the Lord's doings? Judgment? And what about judgment?
Yeah. And so as we, we look at this idea of, of judgment, we look at the judgment that the Babylonians are going to bring, the judgment the Babylonians are going to go through themselves, and we can, we can fear that, stand in, I guess, horrified of, of what might happen because we, we don't know and it's going to be an awful thing to experience the, the wrath and judgment of God. On the other hand, we know that when a judge makes a, a judgment, there are two different judgments that can be made, right? If you're talking about a crime and someone is trying to say, I did it, I didn't do it, what are the two possible options that the judge, or two judgment calls that the judge can make? Guilty, not guilty. Those are two, that's it. You can't, I mean, you could say recess and take a five minute break or whatever too, but that's not a judgment, that's just a procedural thing. So there's guilty or not guilty. When we think of fearing what the Lord can do and the judgment of guilty comes down, then absolutely we ought to fear that. But we stand in awe when the judgment of God comes down and he declares us, his people, as not guilty. We say, whoa, 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 God, but you've, you've seen all of the evidence here. You know my life story. You know the times that I've turned away from you into these other gods. I'm no different than Israel or Judah here. Uh, how can you call me not guilty? And yet God brings that judgment down because of what Christ has done and the faith and trust in him here. So there's the, two, the twofold aspect of judgment. When we talk about judgment, we usually just think of, of guilty, and that's it. But it's important to remember there's two sides of that judgment coin, guilty or not guilty. I don't know if that's the right analogy or not, but uh, remember there's, there's two judgments in there. So we can stand in awe or we could fear his, his judgment. What are some of the other things that the Lord has done that cause us to stand in awe to fear him? He took his people out of Egypt. Exactly. Uh, people who were not a people, he called them to be his people. He brought them out of Egypt. And he provided for them the whole, the whole 40 years of the wilderness. And we can look at all of that Exodus account. Uh, come this afternoon, and we'll find out a whole lot more about the many things that God has done in the Old Testament that we can stand back and stand in awe of the Lord and, and fear him for his power, for his might, for his majesty, uh, for the ways that he... He works, so I'll whet your appetite with that here. But as we hear these things, these acts of God that God has done, and they continue to come down to us, here Habakkuk is saying, I've heard the report about you, and I fear. Then he says, O Lord, revive your works in the midst of years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So saying, God, do the same things that you have done before in the past. As Harlan mentioned, Lord, you have brought your people out of Egypt. You've brought them out of a hard place, a tight bind before. Do it again, Lord, because we know that based on what you've just said, you are going to be bringing us into a similar situation here. So, Lord, do it again. Revive your works in the midst of years and make it known. Make it known, and this is part of what the book of Habakkuk is doing, is making it known. Ahead of time, this is going to happen, but I'm going to also bring you out of here as well, the hope that we have in him. What is, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll put it this way. What is the primary means that God uses to make his acts known? Maybe that's the, okay, his word and sacrament, and uh, as that comes to us, how does that come to us? I don't know if this is the right way I'm asking the question. Where do we learn about his word? What's the primary means for that? Okay, the Bible, absolutely. We learn it from the Bible. And who has God called to be the primary teachers for that, to pass that on? Pastors, churches, prophets. I think that's probably a pretty common answer that we, we come to. Families, in the Old Testament, it's families. Do this. Tell these things to the next generation. Do this for your children and their children and their children. It's primarily a, a I don't know if you want to call it a homegrown thing. Yes, we come, we come to church to learn about God's Word, to hear God's Word, to study God's Word. That's an hour or two hours a week, maybe three on a good week, four if you're... <laughs> If you're really ambitious kind of a thing but how many other hours throughout the week do we have are we being formed what are we being formed by being formed by the world being formed by our friends being formed by our neighbors being formed by media being formed by all these different things and if we're just going to say that's the pastor's job that's the church's job that's just whoever else's job the prophet's job it's not my job 
as a parent, my job as, as a Christian, my job as, as a friend, then we're going to get results where we're going to disassociate the, uh, yeah, we're just not going to know, know what God has done, I guess. Yeah. The primary, uh, the, yeah. Here's a here's a quote from uh, one of the commentaries that I was looking at. It says this: "There is no more solemn or necessary responsibility laid upon parents and the church of any age than to teach the next generation what the Lord has done for them and it's, and expects of them." I think many of us here are beyond. Uh, parenting ages where kids are growing up in our home, right? So you, you've, you've gone through this stage before. Uh, well, some, we're in this together, yeah. Samuel, you're not allowed to graduate yet. Um, but what are some of, the, some of the temptations that get in the way of teaching God's word at home? Busyness, what kind of busyness? Work gets in the way, life gets in the way, school gets in the way. Absolutely, and it's, it's important for us to realize what is our responsibility as parents? Are, are our five-year-old kids able to discern, okay, this is what I need to do with my time and, and all these different things? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we need to look at ourselves and say there's, there's a certain amount that I am permitting these things to happen. I have forgotten that my primary responsibility as a parent is to raise up my kids in the Lord, to pray for them, to teach them God's word. And I'll say it's not too late to do that or to set that example either. Even if your kids are gone, you're still able to do that. And it, it's not to say that any of these things are evil in themselves or that they're not good. That's not the point that I'm making here. But too much of a good thing, we can, we can get distracted by the most important thing. Yeah. 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 So here's a, a question for you to, to think about. How can we as a congregation tell of what the Lord has done? What does that look like for us as a congregation? How can we as a congregation speak of what the Lord has done? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they can argue with scripture too if they want to, but at the end of the day that's yeah, uh, we go back to the experiences that God has given to us, the experiences that God has recorded for us in Scripture. And we continue to talk about those things, to speak about those things, and to stand in awe and wonder of what God has done. That's an, an opportunity for us as a congregation, as parents. We have opportunities for that as well, to raise up our kids in, in the faith. And this can look different in every different home, whether it's spending time in the mornings together in scripture, spending time throughout the day in scripture, praying with your kids, uh, talking about Sunday school lessons after Sunday school, or talking about services after, on your way home from church. All of these different things are opportunities that we have that God has given to us to continue to make the faith something that doesn't just stay within these walls, but it goes with us wherever we go. And it, for uh, grandparents as well, to talk to the grandkids, say, what are you worry, lurking, learning about? What are you doing? What has God been teaching you? And I tell you some of the experiences that God has brought me through. And that's not bragging, and I want to put this out there, that's not bragging. Um, it's, it's breaking about the Lord, if anything. And that's a good thing. It's a, it's a thing that God has called us to do.
Yeah, and there are, there are things that God has put into our lives that can help draw us to the Lord. For instance, go outside at night, look up in the sky. Is there anything in Scripture that talks about stars? You can talk about creation. Hey, do you know who made those stars? You can talk about uh, the promises that God made to Israel, or to Abraham. Say, I'm going to make your offspring more numerous than the stars. Go ahead and count them. And talk about what, what God is saying with that. Uh, there are opportunities in creation that, we, that God has given us to, to point back to the Creator. And so we can use that. And I would encourage us to, to be using, using those different opportunities that God has given to us. All right, we'll move on to the last little phrase here in chapter, two, or chapter 3, verse 2. In wrath, remember mercy. In the time of Habakkuk, or in the message of Habakkuk, God is revealing his wrath to his people here. And what is that wrath looking like for them? What's going to happen in the near near future? I could better it a couple of times this morning already. Somebody's coming. Uh, the Babylonians for this time, yeah. Yeah, the Babylonians are coming for Judah. So here's God's wrath made, uh, made visible to them in the fact that the Babylonians are coming to teach them the lesson. And in this, I'm not saying God send this away, don't, don't make this happen, but in this wrath, Lord, remember mercy. Is God merciful? Absolutely, he is. Is he just? Absolutely, he is. And so the prayer is, God, I know, what, I know you're doing what, you, what needs to be done, but I, I'm also praying that you don't act according, or you don't act uh, against the nature, against your nature, kind of a thing. Remember mercy in your wrath, Lord. Remember mercy. I'll accept your wrath that comes, but remembering mercy as well. As we take this little phrase, we can look at this as well. Where is uh, the clearest picture of God in His wrath, also remembering mercy? The most stark picture that we have of that. So that we can know without a shadow of a doubt. Absolutely. There's mercy there for those eight people that survived. Where else is. Jesus dying on the cross, exactly where God's wrath and his mercy and justice all intersect. And so as, as we look at this message of, of Habakkuk saying, God, your justice is coming and I'm terrified of it. Uh, in wrath, remember mercy. And sometimes in our own lives too, wrath comes for us, judgment comes for us for some of the, some of the stupid things that we do, and probably rightfully so at times. But we can say, God, in your wrath, remember mercy, and we can remember his mercy and look back at the cross and go back to that judgment call of God again and recognize as we confess our sins, you are declared to be not guilty. And more than that, you are declared to be holy, sinless, perfect. And that's where we see God's, uh, God's wrath and mercy coming together and being dispensed to us and for us on our behalf. So that's an important thing to remember here. All right, moving on to verse 3. Uh, and we'll read a couple of verses here. God comes from Taman. And the Holy One from Mount Paran, his splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight, and he has rays flashing from his hand, and there is the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan under distress, the ten curtains of the lack of Midian, we're trembling. Here in verses 3 through 7, Habakkuk remembers the work of the Lord. He's picturing again, God, these are the things that you have done. I know that you are able, you are capable of interacting in human history because you've done it before and you are able to save us. You're able to work in, in nature. Habakkuk here is picturing Israel's covenant God is coming to rescue his people in their hour of desperate need. That again comes from the People's Bible Commentary in case you're wondering uh, where that's coming from. But coming from Mount Paran is associated with uh, the wilderness of Paran and that wilderness exodus, or the wilderness wandering in the exodus. Saying, God, you came to us even when we weren't a people. You brought us out of Egypt and you were with us every step of the way. Even when, even when you had to send your judgment and those fiery serpents were there that we didn't really like, God, you were there in our midst. 
when those people rebelled against the authority and, and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them whole, them and their families, God, you were there in our midst. When Moses went up to the, to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments and came down and saw that, behold, there's this golden calf. This is the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. You were there in their midst, in our midst. God, you were with us all of these times. And Habakkuk is remembering these things of the Lord, these deeds of the Lord's of the Lord. In verse 3, heaven and earth declare his praise. In verse 4, his glory bursts forth. In verse 5, pestilence and plague do the Lord's bidding, who is the judge and the avenger. Uh, verse 6, heaven and earth may pass away, the Lord will not. His ways are everlasting, and as is his word. We can be tr- trust in who he is. So in this prayer, the, uh, Habakkuk comes to the Lord and says, God, I'm kind of slightly terrified, or more than slightly terrified, of what's going to happen here. And I'm standing in awe of who you are and your work that you're going to do. God, I'm praying that you would do that work again. Show yourself again to be the God who delivers, the God who saves in our day and age because we need to see it for ourselves. You know that we are traveling after, running after all of these other, these other idols, these other places where we can go for salvation and life and all these different things. But God, we need to see you again. And he goes back and uh, recounts some of the things that God has done. It's not everything, but it's a major thing. And as we've been going through the Old Testament the last however many years, remember the number of times that he says, remember, I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. Remember the exodus from Egypt and going back to this event where God made himself known to his people. He's doing that again here. Habakkuk is remembering who the Lord is. sharing of the work of God in, in our own our own lives. Um, and as we think of what, what God has done for us, we can think just to our own lifetime here, but what God has done for us is also everything in the Old Testament, everything in the New Testament. God is actively acting for you and for your salvation with this. And so we, we recognize this is our history as well. Though we might not have an Israeli passport, or we might not have Jewish blood inside of us, we recognize as God's people, this is our history. This is God acting throughout history to save and redeem us. So that's a good thing to point back to people and say, speaking of what the Lord has done, now this is what God has called all believers to do. Verses 8 through 11. Did the Lord rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made bare, the rods of chastisement were sworn. You cleaved the earth with rivers. Mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of waters swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. The sun and moon stood in their places. It went away at the light of your arrows, with the radiance of your gleaming spear. Here in verses 8 through 11, what is, uh, what's Habakkuk praying about and, and praising the Lord for? What is he acknowledging here in these verses? Absolutely. All creation stands in awe of God and, and bows down to God, even the inanimate objects. And that's a, a promise of Scripture that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. Uh, something that we, we recognize and we confess will happen. Uh, throughout the Psalms, there are numerous Psalms talking about uh, the trees will clap their hands. They don't have hands to clap. They can't really clap. The, the rocks will shout your praise. I haven't heard a rock scream yet. Maybe someday it'll, it'll come. But this is all about talking about God's work in nature, pointing back to the Creator, pointing back to the one who has made heaven and earth and declaring his praise. Anything else that's being talked about there in those passages?
can the waters of the earth thwart God's plans? No. Can the mountains, the immovable mountains, stop him? No. Can the weather patterns catch the Lord off guard? No. Uh, a lot of times in, in our day and age, you'll probably hear the, the phrase Mother Earth and say, oh, Mother Earth is just doing her thing, kind of a thing. No. Mother Earth, the Earth can't do that. The Lord is the one who is in charge of these things and is in uh, controlling these things. It's not, a, it's not our mother who is doing this different thing. Uh, but again, pointing back to the Lord is sovereign over creation. He reigns over creation. And this is important for Habakkuk's people in Habakkuk's time because they had all these other gods that represented the God of water. Here's the God of water, the God of chaos who organizes the chaos. This is a God that we can worship. Uh, the, the patron God of the sailor, I guess. You can talk about that God. If you're going to go on a, a trip, you could go and, and worship this God, make a sacrifice to this God. The, the quote unquote patron God of the harvest or of the field. If your fields weren't doing so well, there was a God for that too. There's a God for every single thing that you needed here on this earth that you could go to and you could worship and they would interact in your life and make your life wonderful, all daisies and roses and all this different stuff, just whatever it is. And so they had these, these ideas pulling at them. And here in this passage, Habakkuk is saying, no, Lord, you are in control of these things. It's not these, these little G gods that are coming in and they're doing all these things. No, God, you are in control of them. I recognize that and I'm submitting to your judgment here with this. So the passage uh, continues on here. This is, again, poetic language, emphasizing God's majesty and his power, speaking against the gods of other nations, which is the very thing that God's people needed to remember. As they're being tempted to be drawn towards the gods of other nations or the other gods of their own nation, whether it's wealth or prosperity or anything like that, um, God is calling them back to himself here in these passages. In verse 12, In indignation you marched through the earth in anger, he trampled the nations. What is this verse speaking about in relation to the Lord? Verses 8 through 11 is talking about God being sovereign over nature. What's verse 12 revealing about God? Yeah, God is over nations as well. Whether they submit to him or not, it's irrelevant. God is over them. And God is the one who can trample nations. He has done that in the past. Um, and he will do that in the future as well. And he can do it today and, and even now. As we look at this idea of the Lord exerting his power over other nations uh, and using, <laughs> using nature to do that, what are some some events of history, some events of the Old Testament where God has done that, used nature to declare a victory, to use a victory to win a war against a nation. Noah's Ark, there you go. Let's get all the nations all at one time. Here, a global flood. That's, that's one. God used nature there. God was the one who was sitting at, on the throne at the flood. He sits as king forever. That was one option, or one evidence of it. Yeah, there's a big earthquake that uh, swallowed, swallowed people up. I think that was in the wa wilderness wandering when people were grumbling about Moses' leadership, saying, why do you get to be the leader? I want to be the leader. And it didn't go well for, for them with that. But yeah, that was an, an option where, or an example of God using nature to bring his judgment. Walls of Jericho, and how was that? You mean if you stomp hard enough that that's not going to bring bring those walls down? No, it's not about stomping hard. It's God bringing those walls down. Yeah, yeah the Red Sea. The Egyptian army swallowed up, drowned in the Red Sea. The sun standing still. Uh, the Israelites are winning a battle. The sun starts going down. Joshua says, uh, God, we need a little bit more time just to, to bring this victory out. So can you just... Uh, 
let's keep that big yellow orb up in the sky for a little bit so we can see what we're doing and we can fulfill your will. God says, yeah, sure, I'll do that for you. And the Israelites continue and wipe out this opposing army. Sun stands still. It doesn't happen, but it happened. The Lord directed nature to accomplish his will, to trample, quote unquote, the nations. Are there any other, any other examples of scripture where this happens? There's a lot of them. You think of hailstones falling down from heaven, um, swallowing people up, or, or yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened there? <laughs> Big stones, and fire and brimstone, fell out of the sky, swallowed them up. Exactly, all of these things. God is revealing that He is the one who tramples nations as well. You can even look at the Canaanites being expelled from. Uh, from their own land, or vomited up that we looked at it last week or two weeks ago or something like that, um, because they were, the land had, they had defiled the land to a point where God said, enough is enough, this is my land, get out of here, I'm taking you out of here. And he tells the Israelites, go in and wipe out every last one of them. Um, and they, of course, didn't do that, all that God had told them to do, but God still gave them the land and was very clear, saying, listen, I'm not giving you this land because you've earned it. I'm not giving you this land because you deserved it. I'm not giving you this land because you're so much better than these other people. No, 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 no. I am giving you this land because I promised it to you, and I'm giving you this land because these people are so wicked, the land itself is vomiting them out. I am getting rid of them. This is a judgment, and you get to receive, reap the benefits of that. So here, verse 12, again, recognizing that as the Lord is sovereign over creation, he's also sovereign over the nations as well and he has acted interacted in the past um, and he will continue to do so even to this day and beyond until Christ comes back then we get to verses 13 through 15 you went forth for the salvation of your people for the salvation of your anointed you struck the head of the house of evil to lay him open from thigh to neck you pierced him with his own spears the head of his throngs, they stormed in, in to scatter us. Their exultation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses on the surge of many waters. Again, Habakkuk is praising the Lord for his deliverance, that this is a God, he is a God who accomplishes salvation for his people. As verse 13 is very clear saying, God, this is why you are acting. What is the reason that God is acting in human history for? What's the purpose of that? Okay, and why does God crush the wicked? Is it just because he likes to thwart them and stomp on them and say, we're better than you? Okay, so he doesn't want that to be the dominating thing. Any other reasons why God might snuff out the wicked? There's people's salvation. Exactly. Whether it's uh, God saying, destroy all of their idols because they're going to turn you away, so we're wiping out everything here. I'm doing this for your salvation. I'm doing this to save you, to draw you out of this. Or for the people who are, who are being persecuted by these other nations. Whether it's the Assyrians outside the gates of uh, Jerusalem and 185,000 of them don't wake up the next morning and Israel is, is spared, Judah is spared from that. Uh, God is snuffing them out. Why? For the salvation of his people. And as we look back at, at all the events of history, God is revealing himself to make himself known for the purpose of our salvation. Calling us back to himself. When we forget or we neglect to put the purpose on all of these things and we can stand back and we can be really confused and say, God, this, I don't really understand this. What, what's the whole deal with this? It's important for us to look back and say, God is acting for people's salvation, calling people to himself all throughout human history. He is doing that. Uh, so we, I'll ask this question again. What are some of the ways that God has done that? That he has went forth, that he has gone forth for the salvation of his people. Absolutely. What does verse 13 say? You went forth for the salvation of your people, 
for the salvation of your anointed, you struck the head of the house of the evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. You have slain the evil one. If I can read, rearrange the, the meaning for that verse there. You have slain the evil one. You have come forth and you have done this. And so we look and say, God, where have you done this? When have you done this? We can look back in human history at the incarnation and see, God, you have uh, gone forth you left the comfort of heaven, you came into this earth as a child, took on flesh to defeat this Satan, this devil, this serpent. Going all the way back to Genesis, uh, Genesis is it 3? Genesis, yeah, Genesis chapter 3, at the end of where uh, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, and the promise is given to Eve, uh, your seed will, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. We'll look back to the cross to see this has happened. So as Habakkuk is, is saying this and praying this, he's looking forward to this event, to this work of God. And it, it says here in past tense, you went forth for the salvation of your people. Has this happened at the time of Habakkuk yet? Not yet. But in the, in the promises of God, it's as good as a done deal. Um, and so we look back to that, and he takes comfort in that. But he also looks back to the different ways that God has acted against evil in the past that we talked about in verse verse 12 and all those other those other nations so he's looking ahead towards towards the cross here and we can see it's the fulfillment of this there in christ and then verse 14 you pierce with his own spears the head of his throngs they stormed him to scatter us their exultation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret you trampled on the sea with your horses on the surge of many waters Again, language, poetic language that's bringing up this idea, again, of the Egyptians in the Red Sea, saying, God, you are the one who has trampled them. You are the one who has delivered them. You are the one has, or who has delivered us. You have wiped them out. Reminiscing of Egypt again, reminding them who the Lord is. So all of this, uh, all of Habakkuk's prayer is anchored in who the Lord is, what the Lord has done, what the Lord is going to do for his people. And it's in this basis that he has hope. And so we go on to his final reflections of verses 16 through 19. I heard, and my inward parts trembled, at the sound of my, and this, at the sound of my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and though there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet, and makes me walk on high places. The choir director on, string, on my stringed instruments. What is he saying here in verses 16 through 19? Seems like he's saying you have to die before you be saved. Mm -hmm. And is that final victory guaranteed? Absolutely it is. Backup takes a long range approach to what's happening here. That is going to get real ugly. And I'm not really looking forward to this. Uh, verse 16, he's trembling. He doesn't want to deal with the Babylonian barbarism that's coming to him and his people. And there's nothing that he can do and that his people can do to fend this off or to stop this from coming. It's coming by the Lord's hand. But again, the purpose for which God is bringing this judgment is for their salvation, as he just talked about in uh, verse 13. But this is a little different tone to this prayer at the end than from verses 2 and four, two through 4, isn't it? How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and yet you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, and yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored, and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. That's the beginning of the book. Habakkuk is asking the Lord these questions. And then here at the end of this book, he recognizes, I'm, fearing, I'm trembling, I'm afraid. Yet in all of that, though the fig tree should not blossom, 
Though the field should not produce fruit, that the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I'll rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Does Habakkuk have all the answers to the questions that he was asking? He doesn't. But he's reminded again of who the Lord is and what he has done. Though devastation comes, no crops, no food, no flocks, no cattle, that would be a reason for mourning and feeling of helplessness. But Habakkuk is not without hope. He's trusting in the Lord and says, none of these earthly things really matter at the end of the day. What matters is the Lord is uh, my hope, my strength. He's the God of my salvation. Yet in spite of these things, in light of these things, he has reason to exalt in the Lord. And the last little word here, the last uh, part of the verse, for the choir director on my stringed instruments, this was written to be a song sung by God's people to remind them of when things get tough, when things go poorly, when it, doesn't, when it doesn't seem like God is on the throne, to remind them in proper perspective, God is on the throne. He is uh, still actively involved in this world. He is still our hope, a rock of salvation. Uh, he is still the one in whom we can exalt. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a song like that in our worship service that we could kind of sing on a weekly basis because we need to remember that, right? We sing the, the offering hymn, which is a good thing to remember, uh, to kind of form us with that, to remember that we are sinners and we need God's help with this. Uh, same kind of thing. Well, I don't have a song exactly about this, but there's a song uh, by a group called Shane and Shane, called Though You Slay Me, and we're going to end this Sunday School class listening to this. So I'll pass out some lyrics to you so you can follow along with it, and we'll end just uh, listening with this.